Amen. I'd like to preach to you this morning under this subject title, Ships That Never Sail. Amen. Ships That Never Sail. You may be seated this morning. I just uh, a few weeks back, my uh, son John received a postcard in the mail from his Aunt Eva as they were traveling around the United States. And uh, that postcard had the faces and likeness of four presidents of the United States uh, in a place called Mount Rushmore, which I am sure you are quite familiar with. In South Dakota, there is this large slab of stone and where you can find the likeness of these presidents, uh, 60 feet to 70 feet, 70 feet profiles of our four most popular presidents in the United States, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt, and they are perhaps the most fondly remembered presidents of this nation. And just like we commemorate these great uh, men that were so fondly remembered in history and the annals of uh, our American history, the Old Testament also has its list of favorites. The children of Israel also had certain individuals that they also held in high esteem. And uh, it was a uh, popularity list, so to speak. Um, amongst those would be included David, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Now, Jehoshaphat, of all the four, is perhaps the one that we know least about. He is the most unknown, and he is perhaps the one that uh, is least spoken about. The Bible tells us that during the uh, time of Asa's last years, there was a growth of quite uh, unsavory conditions that had taken root in the nation of Israel. And so Jehoshaphat immediately took steps to uh, improve the situation there in the nation of Israel. And he did more than just shut up the, the doors of the vice and, and the places of idol worship. He went a little bit beyond those things. He was smart enough to know that he had to create a new frame of mindset for the people. People had lost their way. They had uh, turned themselves over into uh, all kinds of vice and idolatry and worship. And so he knew that it was necessary to build structure amongst the nation of Israel. And so he did more than just simply close the doors of those uh, places of ill repute, those places of vice, and those places where the idol worship was done. But with rare imagination amongst kings, he began to select men from around the country, men of talent, men of uh, promise. And uh, he began to organize them into groups, into teams. And he began to send these groups to teach God's law throughout the nation of Israel. So uh, it was a time of great education. And he was a king who focused on educating the people about God's law, about the truth that was found in Scripture. The Bible also shows us that he was also a great administrator. He knew how to administrate and to conduct uh, the, the affairs of the nation. And so he became involved uh, later on down the road. We know that he became involved in a bad alliance. And, and he got involved in certain things and was pulled into an ill-advised battle. Something that he probably should not have gotten involved in, but he was pulled in. The Bible tells us that Ahab was killed and that Jehoshaphat barely escaped with his life. And so uh, we know that there were moments in his life where he didn't always uh, do the right thing or, or, or uh, uh, make the right decisions. But he was a king that was determined to bring his people back to where they needed to be. And so we find also in scripture that he began to found courts and and those courts uh, in, in their original state were uh, in bad shape. And so he began to appoint local judges for every walled city. And he began to institute the court system. And he instituted two court systems of appeal. One was for civil and one was for ecclesiastical cases. And it was uh, in some of these uh, uh, places where there were half-civilized desert tribes that began to rise up against Jehoshaphat and, and, and began to fear for the kingdom. And the Bible tells us that he was told, Fear not, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them, take your position, stand still, and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, and be not dismayed. 
tomorrow will go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Aren't you thankful that you serve a God who is with you? Not just in the good times, but He's with you when the dawn gets rough. He's there where the metal meets the road. Amen? And so He was closer to the people, perhaps, uh, than any other king with the exception of David. And Jehoshaphat's name is still remembered on in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And one of the last things he did was that he went into the shipping business. And, uh, you know, living here in Houston, and we've got the, all the, the channels of the Gulf. There's a lot of shipping that goes on in here. And that's what Jehoshaphat got involved in. He went into the shipping business, but he went into it at a grand scale. And uh, the Bible tells us that Ophir, which represents the place of his desire, Tharshish, which represents the design or the intention which he had, and the Zion Eber, which represents that place of disappointment, which is a place I'm sure everyone is familiar with at some point in their lives. We've all been at a place where we've been disappointed. We've all been at a place where we felt like we've been let down. And so these ships, the Bible tells us, were made in Tharshish, and they were made with an intention. And the intention was that they would go from the Gulf of Aqaba to the Red Sea and from there to the Gulf of Suez and that they would arrive at Ophir so that they might acquire gold. But the Bible tells us that they went not. They did not arrive at their destination. They did not arrive at the place that they were intended. They were built for a purpose. They were built and designed specifically to achieve something. And yet all that hard work, all the labor that went into building and constructing these ships, the Bible tells us that they went not because they were broken, designed to burn and for the ever set sail. And so the ships never set sail. They never even attempted the trip. And so here we have ships and a ship is designed specifically with one purpose in mind. And that purpose is so that it will sail, but it went not. Now this could be very well a picture of life. To each one of us this morning, there is given an opportunity. To each one of us this morning, there is a chance and an opportunity, which is called time. Time is given to us by God. It is a gift from God. Now how much time we have is a secret. We don't know how much time we have. But time is life's book. It is life's tree. It is life's ladder. It is life's bookkeeper. And God has ordained that time would be our opportunity so that we can prepare ourselves for eternity. And so David, as he cried out, my heart is fixed. David had in his tender years of his youth while he was guarding the flocks amongst the Judean hills. He had made God his choice. He had decided that this is for me from early on in his life. He said, God is my choice. My heart is fixed. My heart is determined. And so we decide or we realize that we cannot stand still in God. We must move forward. We must move forward. Because every day brings us closer to a destination. Whether we're, we think we're choosing or not, we're making a choice every single day. With every action that we make, with every decision that we make, I'm making a choice. If I wake up on a Sunday morning and I say, you know, I just don't feel like going to church this morning, I'll go on Thursday. They started this new service, and I'll just go on Thursday. I've made a choice. I've made a, a decision that will impact my life. No matter what it is, no matter how great the decision or how small the decision, everything I do impacts my life. support the South, he couldn't support the North, he felt torn in between two, and so he came with a, uh, with a great idea, or at least it was a great idea to him, he decided that he would wear the navy blue jacket, but he would keep the Confederate gray pants. There was a problem with that, that every time he ran into the Confederate troops, he got shot in the jacket, and every time he ran into the Union troops, he got shot in the trousers. Now, we have to make up our minds. I said we got to make up our minds.
his uh, trouble and thought, he decided he had to make a choice. So he did. And so we find that we also must make a choice. We must decide. And so the moral to this story is that we can be doubly disastrous. 1 Kings 18 and 21 says, To halt between two opinions is a dangerous thing. You can't halt between two opinions. Long ago, our Savior said in Matthew 6 and 24 that no man can serve two masters. Amen. And even longer before that, Joshua said, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. And so we cannot put off the most important decisions in our life. We can't just say, Well, I'll make a decision tomorrow. I'll make a decision next week. Or I'll wait to that perfect service. Or I'll wait to that perfect message. Or I'll, I'll wait for that perfect song to, to, to move.
when, when I get my life in order, then I'll start witnessing to people. When I'm not so busy, I'll read my Bible. When I'm not so busy, I'll pray more. But the problem is, is that procrastination is a sin. It is. Procrastination is a sin. The Bible tells us in James 4 and 17, to him that knows what to do and does it not, to him, it is a sin. If you know to do something and you keep putting it off, if you know to do something and you know that it's right to do it, and you say, you know what, I'm just going to wait till next week. I'm going to wait till next month to get this right. It is a sin. And many of us live as if we wonder when life is going to begin. When are you going to start living? Are you going to start living in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s? Do you continue to put things off? When are you going to make your mind up? It isn't always clear just what we're waiting for. But we persist in waiting so chronically that before we know it, life has slipped us by. And the years have rolled by. And we keep building ships for our lives, but the ships never sail. We keep making plans. standing there still waiting for something to happen. There are fathers waiting until their obligations are less demanding to become acquainted with their sons and before they know it time has slipped back by and their sons are grown men and they don't know their own children. Oh wait, I, I, I've got to work this job, i got to make this commitment, i got to do that, i got to I'll find time for my son some other time until some other time is too late. There are mothers who, at the earliest convenience, sincerely attend, attend to be more attentive to their daughters, but times pass by and distance begin to widen and their daughters grow up and go away. There are husbands and even wives who just keep telling themselves, I'm gonna be more understanding. I'm gonna be more considerate. I'm gonna be more loving. But time alone does not draw people closer. There are those who are going to give up bad habits. They say, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing this. There are those who are going to eat more wisely. I'm one of those. I keep telling myself, I'm going to eat better. I'm going to eat better. And then you keep going to the restaurant and ordering the same things. I'm going to eat better this year. I'm going to lose weight this year. And yet, you don't do anything about it. There are those who are going to live within their week, their means. Someday. At some day, at some point, there won't be a day. At some point, they'll get out of the hole. I'm going to live within my means, my means. But the problem is that all those ships are built, ready to go. And yet, they never sail. They never go anywhere. There is no reason to doubt all such good intentions. But when in the world are we going to begin to live as if we understand that this life is short. That life is but a vapor. That I am promised today. 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 This is the day. This is the hour of the church. This is the day of salvation. Today is the day. This is our time. This is the hour for the church. This is our generation. There is this uh, terrace, it's a small terrace, and it is on top of a watershed. And this terrace is so level that when rain falls upon this terrace, it, it's almost like the water is confused. It doesn't know which way to go. It's, it's so flat. And so the water seems like it just sits right in that one place because it doesn't know which way to go. But there is a wind that blows. And that wind that blows, that faint breath of wind, it rolls over from the west side. And that water that gets hit by that western wind begins to descend into what we call the Valley of the Roses.
and it is the location in Scripture that we call the Plain of Sharon. It is a place of fertility. It is a place of beauty. It is a place where fruit springs up. And finally, it is exhaled towards heaven in the fragrant cups of the lilies and the roses of Sharon that grow in that valley. But there is a large part of it that finds itself on the other side of the terrace that is not moved on by the wind. It is not moved on by the Holy Ghost. And that other water descends. And that water descends down the dark valley of Tophet. And it ends up in the Dead Sea. Now, what I have learned is this. The character is completely fashioned will. Character is completely fashioned will. But will is a group of tendencies that act in every emergency in life. And a tendency to act is only effective in proportion to the times that we act. And so it is what we do in each opportunity that is really important in life. Because, you know, we, we say, well, I have a tendency to do that. If we're not careful, it is our tendencies that form our will, and it is our will that forms our character. It is the small things in your life that determine who you are. It is the little things that you do that determines who you are. And sometimes we think, well, it's not that big of a thing. But I'm telling you, each and every day, I need to have the Holy Ghost flowing in my life so that I can be fruitful, so that that beautiful things can spring up into my life. Because if I'm not careful, my life will go down another road to a valley that is dead, to bitter waters, to a sea of death. What's amazing about this terrace is this terrace is actually called the terrace of indecision. Indecision. I don't know what to do. And the problem is that when you don't know what to do, you just don't do anything. Ships that never sail. Now most people have the intention of coming to God. But for some reason or another, they don't. They don't let those ships sail. But the question is, why are you waiting? Psalms 39 and 7, the Bible says, And now, Lord, what wait I for if my hope is in thee? Millions, honestly and sincerely, intend. They have every full intention. One day I'm going to live for God. One day I'm going to come to the Lord. But they simply never get around to doing it. Oh, they'll come and maybe visit church for a week or two or a month. Come and maybe backslid and come back, get refilled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, and begin to, but then before they know it, they slip right back out. They say, Oh, it just didn't work out. The opportune moment never seems to walk, arrive. And so they continue to wait and to wait. Now, I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> they don't wait because the church doesn't want them. I'm going to tell you something about churches. Churches want new people. Amen. They want souls to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. They want them to be baptized in Jesus' name. They want to see their lives change. They want to see God move in their lives. And in the name of Jesus, every church opens its doors wide open. Makes it a free place so that they can come. So that they can hear the preaching and the teaching of the Word. And in the name of Jesus, every church opens its doors and says, Welcome. So the problem isn't getting through the doors. You can get through the doors of the church. There is a joy in the presence of the angels of God. The Bible tells us over one sinner that repented. The church has its doors wide open. So the problem is not the church. It's also not because time will make the decision easier. Actually, statistics prove that the longer you wait to make a decision, the harder it is to make the decision. The longer you keep putting something off, the harder it is to do it. So the Bible tells us also that now is the accepted time. Now. Now. It's not because the process of salvation is too difficult. I'm going to tell you something. The process of salvation is not difficult. Jesus came to fishermen and he said, follow me. Follow me. And the Bible tells us that they straightway left their nets and followed him. I'm going to tell you, it is that simple. It is 
making a choice. I will follow the Lord. I will follow Him. All the fitness that is required of you is for you to need Him. I need you. I will follow you. I will go where you go. I will go wherever you lead. And He will lead you to the house of the Lord. He will lead you to an altar of repentance. He will lead you by the still water. He will restore your soul. He will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. You will go down in the baptism of the, of the name of Jesus Christ. And you will be made a new creature. But you've got to make up your mind. I will follow Him. It's not because it is safe to do so. Solomon said, boast not thyself of tomorrow. Jesus said, watch. You know neither the day nor the hour. The truth is resolutions are no good. You're just building ships. But they're not sailing. They're not going anywhere. There's a, there's a bar in Arkansas. It has a sign on the outside of the bar that says, free beer tomorrow. But the problem is that every day you get there, the beer is only free the next day. It's never free today. No matter what they want, they can't get that free beer. It's only ever free the next day. Many people say tomorrow to almost everything when it comes to God if they're not careful, which is really the most important thing in life. But like I said in Proverbs 27, what boast not thyself of tomorrow? Quit putting it off. That thing that you've been saying I'm going to start doing, that thing that you said I'm going to commit to that, that, that vision that the pastor has, that, that desire that I always don't put it off. The longer you put it off, the longer you wait, the least likely you are of ever doing it. You've got to make up your mind today. I am going to do this for God. I am going to do this for my family. I am going to do this for my relationship with God. Shakespeare said it at best. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable recorded time and all your yesterdays have lighted fools away to dusty death. Don't Put your hopes on tomorrow. You've got to live today. I said you've got to live for today. You've got to make your choices for today. James 4, verses 13 and 14. Go to ye that say tomorrow, for ye know not what shall be on the morrow. And he speaking, who is Jesus a woman in the crowd called, cried out in Luke 11, 27. God bless you. your mother, the womb from which you came, and the breast that gave you suck. But then when he replied, he said, yes, but even more blessed are all those who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Now, it is more blessed to be a doer of the word of God than to have been married the mother of Jesus. It is more blessed to simply obey the commandments of God. And we must remember that words without actions are the assassins of your dreams. Your dreams, your aspirations, the things that you hope for, words without actions, kill them. Because you're not going anywhere. You're building ships that never sail. The smallest good deed is better than the greatest intention. I don't care how great your intention is, the smallest thing you'll ever Do it today. William III was the king of England. And he made a proclamation when there was a revolution in the northern part of Scotland that all who came and took an oath of allegiance on the 31st of December would be pardoned of their rebellion. But McGeehan, who was a chieftain of a prominent clan in Scotland, resolved to return with the rest of the rebels said, okay, we'll return. But there was a lot of pride in McKeon. He didn't want 
want to do it first. So he resolved in his mind that he would be the last holdout. So he could say, I was the last one. And so just a few days before December 31st, he began to travel. But the problem is that on the way, a snowstorm broke out. And en route to receive his pardon that had been freely given, he showed up too late. And all the rest of the chieftains and their men were pardoned, but McKeon and his men were put to death because they showed up too late. Because of their pride. And while others were set free, while others were able to lift up their hands and praise the Lord and run to an altar, while others began to rejoice in the many things that God had offered them, they sat in the back. I'll go to the altar another Sunday. I'll wait for another message. I'll wait for a better preacher. I'll wait until the moment is just right before I come to an altar and repent. I'll wait for another opportunity. The longer you delay, the harder it will be for you to come. If Lot had tarried any, any longer, it would have been too late for Lot. Our life is made up of years and hours and moments, and we must learn from those moments. Tom Hood said, My 40 years have been 40 thieves, for they have stolen my strength, hope, and many joys. Let not that be your set lament. Young people, listen to me. When you get that age, don't live with regrets. Choose today whom you will serve. Right. Today, don't waste your youth. Don't waste your life. Somebody said time is what we want most and use the worst. I can't remember now. I don't have it written down. But it's unbelievable what, how much time we spend doing certain, certain things in our lives. Can't, it, it's like... Three or four years standing in lines. We spent three or four years of our lives standing in lines, whether it's at the bank or whether it's at the amusement park or wherever it is. Standing in lines, three or four years of your life standing in a line. Oh, we do all kinds of things, but what are we doing for God? What are we doing to improve our relationship? What are we investing in our children, in our homes? Sure, our kids can say they're ABCs, but do they know Jesus? We focus on their education. We want to make sure they get into good college. There's nothing wrong with that. If we want to make sure they got good education. We want them to be doctors and lawyers. Nothing wrong with that. But you better make room for God in your home. I said you better make room for God in your home. You better wake up and say it's more than just their education that I'm worried about. It's more than just what school they're trying to get into. It's more than just those things. I need to make sure that my kids know Jesus Christ. Am I opening up my Bible in my house? Am I reading the Bible stories to my kids at home? Or am I expecting my Sunday school teachers to educate my children? Am I expecting the pastors, the ministry of the church to save my children? No, no, no. I'm going to tell you something. It's not on them to save their children. It's not on the Sunday school teachers to save their children. It's on you. It's on you. Good intentions aren't good enough. They are simply ships that do not sail. Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Dr. Samuel Johnson said, Sir, hell is paved with good intentions. Make up your mind today. Today, stand with me this morning. Don't simply intend to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Don't simply intend to one day get baptized. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Don't intend to one day live holy, live holy. Don't intend to pray, just pray. Don't intend to be faithful, just be faithful. Don't intend to one day be faithful to in my attendance, be faithful, just do it. Don't intend to be faithful in your giving and your tithe and your offering, just do it. Don't intend to be faithful in involvement, just get involved. Get involved. Let your ship sail today. Let it go. Let it go with every intention that you ever had, every good intention that you ever had. Let it sail with a cargo full of hope, with a cargo full of faith. Unleash it this morning. Step out and do that very thing that you have always said you were going to do. Make that commitment that you've always wanted to make. Do it today. Yes, the way to heaven is paved with good intentions, but it's not just good intentions, it's good actions on those intentions. We must act. So could it be said of us this morning that he or she intended to build a life for God, to fight on the Lord's side, to battle, but simply did not have the desire or could not make the decision to do so or perhaps lacks the determination to see it through. Only actions and not intentions take us to heaven. I don't think there's one person that intends to go to hell. I don't think there's one person that intends to lose their relationship with God, but they do. You gotta have more than good intentions. You have to act. Could it be said at the end of our lives, as we face the eternity that he or she not only built their ship but they set sail upon it they built a life intending to live for God and that's exactly what they did they intended to be great for God and they achieved it because they set sail upon that ship I'm going to tell you there are many disappointments in this life. Anyone who tells you that that's not true or that that's not so isn't telling you the truth. There are many disappointments in this life. There are many heartaches. There are many moments where, yes, you do feel like throwing in the towel. There are moments of doubt. There are moments of confusion. But I'm telling you something. You cannot allow that moment of disappointment. control your destiny. You've got to let that ship sail and the storms will come against that ship. It will rock to and fro. But if Jesus Christ is on the wheel, if he's the one leading the way, if he's the one saying, I am with you, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. I will be with you always. Even until the end. If he is in control, all of the disciples, they were worried that morning, that evening, as that storm
And today, there is an altar open to you. Don't wait till Thursday. Don't wait till Sunday. You need to come to this altar this very morning. If you need to repent, you need to repent today. If you need to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit,